Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to start in about two minutes. We're just letting everyone get logged in uh, first and make sure the stream is working well. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm uh, the interim provost, uh, Tom Smith, and I welcome you to the Instructional Continuity uh, Working Group uh, Campus Briefing. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, my partners uh, in this, uh, uh, this briefing. Uh, Associate Provost uh, Ken Barenclaw, uh, Divisional Senate Chair uh, Jason Steich, and uh, our Excite Director, uh, Richard Edwards. Each of us uh, will be uh, providing some details uh, throughout this webinar and work together uh, to answer some of the frequently asked questions at the end. So today we're focusing on return to campus, teaching and learning. Uh, other important issues that I'm sure all of you uh, are focused on, including research, operations, student services, will be addressed uh, in upcoming webinars. So we won't be uh, touching on those today. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you a, a brief overview of uh, where uh, the touch points we're gonna be at today. Um, I'm gonna talk about instructional planning, uh, both the process uh, and the milestones that we've had so far. Um, give you a little bit of sense of uh, what structured our planning for uh, academic year 2021, which we're just finishing up. Uh, right now, and uh, I think we can all success, uh, all say that uh, even though this has been an incredible challenging year for st faculty, staff, uh, and students, uh, we're getting through it uh, with a level of instructional quality, with, which I think has benefited everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the fall 2021 instructional plan, uh, and we're going to get to uh, some FAQs around it. Then we want to give uh, uh, a bit of an overview of the ongoing work 
of the instructional uh, continuity uh, working group, uh, including a, a range of issues from uh, academic uh, Senate issues uh, to uh, campus uh, space for remote uh, class participation. Um, and we'll also provide you with uh, some contact information uh, and additional resources. You know, so to get started, I wanna give you a, a, a brief uh, overview on who is responsible uh, for this work. Uh, a broadly representative committee with around 20 members, you know, from the provost's office, uh, undergraduate education, graduate division, uh, the academic senate, uh, some deans, uh, department chair, uh, students, staff from enrollment services, student affairs, uh, uh, EHS, and other relevant units uh, have been all coming together weekly to try to help uh, with our planning uh, for the fall. Um, we've also been soliciting input from campus uh, constituencies as well as uh, other UC colleagues. Um, based on what you hear today, uh, we're also going to want to uh, hear from you. Uh, so we'll provide you a, a way to uh, uh, get in contact with us to uh, provide uh, additional questions and concerns, which we may not be able to address uh, directly in this webinar. Um, but first, you know, kind of a, a brief history of how we got through the 2021 uh, instructional uh, year. You know, uh, in spring uh, 2020, uh, we made that abrupt shift to remote teaching. You know, it almost felt like the day, you know, before uh, finals week. And it was really truly amazing how the faculty were able to, to make that shift really over the course of a weekend. Um, and students all uh, responded, uh, you know, uh, positively, uh, you know, to an incredibly disruptive uh, time period. Um, in that spring, we started a uh, planning uh, for the current uh, academic year. Um, and we put uh, the instructional planning priorities and uh, forward with the overarching goal and three core principles that we use to guide planning and decision making. First, we prioritize the safety of all members of the campus community. Uh, we wanted to extend access to education to the greatest extent possible. And we wanted to create flexibility at both the individual uh, and institutional level. We used these principles to develop the instructional continuity plan, which has uh, guided instruction uh, since June 2020. Uh, so in that uh, academic year 2020 instructional plan, uh, there were included a few key attributes. Uh, first, in-person was voluntary for both faculty and students. This is where we were really trying to prioritize uh, safety and make everybody feel comfortable about their options. Uh, some exceptions for one-to-one -one courses and uh, medical school uh, courses were made. Uh, we also had uh, some faculty uh, volunteer to teach in person. About 50 class lab uh, performance courses or field-based courses, uh, where you know uh, mask wearing, social distancing and other uh, uh, precautions were put in place to keep everybody safe. But as you can tell, the vast majority of uh, uh, instruction was offered uh, remote. Um, we had provide different ways uh, to provide a remote option. Um, and this was all at the discretion uh, of the instructor. But some key milestones that we met where undergraduate education established the Keep Teaching and Keep Learning websites uh, and enabled new software, um, you know, like Canvas and Uja uh, and Slack in some cases to support remote teaching and learning. ITS established the Loan to Learn program where students who didn't have uh, laptops or Wi Fi hotspots were able to check them out uh, for a term or for the entire year if they were needed. Uh, CHAS uh, ITS and Enrollment Services collaborated on developing an in-person instruction proposal and scheduling system, which really helped us to identify the instructors who wanted to teach in person and how they were 
uh, planning to meet the safety requirements of the university uh, in order to do that. Uh, facility services prepared uh, the classroom and teaching spaces for modified use with uh, uh, current uh, health precautions. The Academic Senate issued policy uh, modifications that our chair uh, could talk about uh, uh, in a bit. Um, and everyone, faculty, students, and staff, uh, certainly deserve praise for the massive, quick, and largely uh, successful shift to remote teaching and learning, which we have now been uh, kind of embedded in uh, for our going on four quarters. So this plan is still in place and will continue during the summer. Right now, uh, all uh, summer courses are planned uh, to be uh, online uh, or remote. Um, this will kind of aid our uh, transition uh, back to more in-person instruction in the fall. So what you really have been waiting for, you know, is uh, a more in-depth discussion of the fall uh, 2021 instructional plan. So our goal in planning, you know, probably uh, over the last two months now, um, you know, has really been driven uh, by President Drake's uh, January letter directing campuses to plan for primarily in-person instruction. The guiding principles have changed uh, over this time period, you know, as we have seen increased vaccination rates and uh, falling uh, infection uh, rates, but they really remain very similar. The emphasis on campus safety has not changed. Uh, personal and uh, institutional health and safety standards for on-campus activities, including instruction, uh, are being developed by the COVID Management Committee to be consistent with applicable uh, public health guidelines. Now, as these are constantly uh, changing, it's hard to say right now uh, exactly what the guidelines are going to be uh, in fall let alone a month from now, or maybe even next week. But we're gonna do our best to keep you uh, updated on uh, exactly uh, the condition and modify uh, what um, our uh, rules uh, are around that as things change. Uh, all in-person instructional activities and anyone participating in these activities will be required to strictly adhere to whatever standards are uh, in place at the time. Okay, so the attributes of the instructional plan. Uh, the goal was uh, 75 to 80% of credit bearing uh, sections uh, to be in person. Uh, remote options are no longer required, but they've been strongly encouraged within each department as a means to extend uh, access to more students when circumstances warrant. We're upgrading uh, classroom technology, and increasing staff support to make them easier uh, to offer. This is what uh, uh, kind of a form of a dual mode uh, instruction, uh, and we'll get into more detail uh, uh, later on that uh, in this webinar. Uh, we're aiming for a classroom density that really depends uh, on class size. Higher density allowed in smaller classes and lower densities in larger classes. Enrollments have not been reduced for, for fall. Instead, classes have been assigned uh, to larger rooms. Our largest classes will remain remote. Progressively higher densities for smaller classes reflects the reduced risk with having fewer people sharing an indoor space, as well as the significant benefit of students participating in higher quality in-person experiences in labs, studios, learning communities, and other intimate settings. All of this relies heavily on continuing improvement in public health conditions, as I mentioned before, and importantly, rising vaccination rates. The UC President's Office has proposed a COVID-19 vaccine requirement for all personnel and students for fall quarter, and we'll be keeping everyone updated as the status of this proposal uh, moves forward. All right, uh, milestones. Um, we did a survey, uh, a few months ago uh, on teaching and learning preferences. You know, more than 600 faculty and 4,000 students responded. And we shared these results with department chairs so that they had a sense of uh, what faculty and students 
uh, were feeling about the fall at the time. Um, the challenge of doing any survey like this is that the data get uh, stale incredibly quickly, uh, particularly uh, as uh, vaccination rates have been uh, increasing. And California now has moved from uh, being a high infection uh, state to a relatively uh, low infection uh, state. But you know, we've been trying to use you know, that information to the extent possible uh, in our planning. Um, In-person percentages uh, are gonna differ across colleges and schools uh, due to differences in pedagogical needs, you know, particularly as I mentioned, labs and studios. Uh, enrolled student circumstances, uh, for example, larger international populations in uh, some majors than in others, uh, and on instructional preferences. Our two largest uh, colleges, which account for 82% of all uh, courses, uh, CHAS will be about 75% in person, and CNAS will be about 93% uh, in person. Uh, undergraduate students will average uh, uh, about half of their courses uh, in person and about half uh, courses uh, remote um, with uh, kind of upper division students and uh, graduate students having uh, more uh, in-person uh, options. The schedule of classes will be published next week uh, uh, when fall registration begins. Now I'm going to pass uh, the torch over to uh, Ken Barenclaw to talk about uh, some of the instructional plan FAQs. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so obviously we have uh, been working hard and accomplished a lot uh, so far, and we're getting a lot of questions about fall. Um, and so we've chosen some of these questions that we're hearing more regularly uh, that we'd like to address and answer today for everyone. Uh, so the first question, please. So the first question we'd like to address is the following. Which courses will be in person? Which will be remote? And how are these decisions made? Um, Tom spoke a little bit about this earlier, but I'd like to give some additional details. Uh, the first thing to know is that um, departments initially were given uh, what we called remote targets for fall quarter. So we might have said, we want you to aim for 20% of your courses to be offered remote and the other 80% to be offered in person. And the goal was for each department to get close to, but not exceed that remote target. So then at the department level, chairs and faculty uh, work together to determine the delivery mode for each course. And then those uh, desired delivery modes were submitted to the registrar's office for scheduling. So the, the main answer to this question is that these were departmental level faculty uh, driven choices. However, um, campus space constraints also played a role. Um, because we're planning, as Tom said, for higher allowable densities among uh, smaller classes, smaller groups, most of those smaller classes were able to be scheduled uh, in person as they normally would be. But to achieve those reduced densities for larger classes without reducing enrollments, we had to move those classes into larger than normal rooms, uh, planning to keep some of the uh, additional seats empty. And because we have fewer of those bigger rooms, uh, some of those classes also had to be moved online during the scheduling process. And of course, for our largest classes, which normally occupy our largest rooms at normal density, all of those classes need to remain online uh, because we simply don't have large enough rooms for those classes. So mostly a locally driven decision-making process, but also affected by campus space constraints. As Tom said, uh, the schedule of classes will be published next week. Um, and it will show the delivery mode for each individual course. And so students should uh, look closely at those delivery modes uh, when registering for classes. Uh, next slide, please. So the second question we'd like to address today is the following. Do students have to participate in face-to-face -face activities for in-person courses in fall quarter? So we are obviously strongly encouraging students to return to campus in the fall. Uh, for a variety of reasons, including helping to rebuild the campus community and also so they can benefit from everything that a residential education has to offer. Um, but we also recognize that a transition period would be helpful. And this is something that we heard uh, through the survey and through other discussions that we've been having. And that's uh, a, a main driver behind why we're gonna continue to offer a mix of in-person and remote 
construction. It's both to enable this transition period uh, because we know that there are a variety of challenging circumstances due to the pandemic that that uh, members of our community are still facing. And it's also um, you know, a, an additional public health precaution that we can provide. Now that at the campus level, that's also true at the individual department level. Uh, most departments are also going to offer a mix of in-person remote classes. As I mentioned before, they each had a remote target. And so each student uh, can expect to enroll in a mix of online and remote classes as well. And it is possible that some students might be able to put together a remote, an entirely remote schedule in the fall. But as Tom mentioned, that's going to be less likely for upper division and graduate students whose classes tend to be smaller. And so they're going to have more of those classes being offered in person. But the bottom line here is that if a course is offered in person, then yes, a student would need to participate in face-to-face -face activities for that class. Another way to say this is that uh, in-person courses are returning to their pre-pandemic normal mode of delivery, and so students would be expected to participate accordingly. Let's move on to the third question, thank you. Third question, uh, what should a student do if a course is offered in person, but they need remote access? This is something we've been discussing a lot lately. So first of all, again, the first thing that a student should do is review the schedule of classes when it is posted next week. Um, if you are in need of a fully remote schedule, then look around for classes that will be offered remotely and see if you can create a schedule that works for you in the fall. Think about things like substituting a remote course for an in-person course. Determine if you can delay enrollment in an in-person course that might be offered again later in the year. Um, if that would you know, suit your circumstances, um, those are the first things to think about. If none of that works for you, then keep in mind uh, that some in-person classes may offer a remote option. A remote option is basically a way for students to satisfy the course requirements in an in-person course without attending any of the face-to-face -face meetings. There's a variety of ways to do this, um, and uh, we might hear more about this a little bit later from Richard. But an example would be if an instructor made um, uh, recordings of all the in-person activities, such as lectures, and posted those recordings online, made sure that all the, elect that all the materials for the course were available e electronically, and ensured that um, examinations could be taken remotely as well. That would effectively create a remote option for students. During the past year, remote options were required for in-person instruction. In the fall, they will no longer be required. Um, it will be determined by departments and faculty which classes will be offering remote options. Now, we are making it easier for these remote options to be offered because we're upgrading classroom technologies, and that's something that Richard will discuss in a little bit. But at the moment, we don't yet know which classes will be offering remote options. Uh, because that's a decision that, I, as I said, that needs to be made by departments, and it likely won't be finalized until later this summer when we have uh, a better view of which rooms have been upgraded and are available. Those technologies will be available for fall use. So if you're a student um, and you need remote access to an in-person course, I have a few things uh, to say about that. The first is that you'll be able to express that desire through an online form that we will post on the registrar's website. This won't guarantee that a remote option will be offered, but it will factor into the decision and it will help us to be able to see where the demand is for these things. Um, later in the summer, we'll look at those requests and departments will make decisions about remote options and post that information in Banner uh, before the window for second pass scheduling opens in early September. So two more comments about this. The first is that uh, for international students who may not be able to secure a visa, uh, what I just said applies to you as well, so please keep that in mind when you're registering for classes. But furthermore, uh, some programs uh, that have large international student cohorts, such as business, have already chosen to offer a relatively larger proportion of remote courses in the fall. And so you should see that when you go to register for your classes, that you have relatively more remote options than you might expect. And finally, uh, for students who uh, want to request a disability-related accommodation, you can do so as you normally would through the Student Disability Resource Center. All right, let's move on to the fourth and last question. Then. 
So the last question we'd like to address today, uh, under what circumstances would you share a return to fully remote instruction or fully in-person instruction in fall 2021? So uh, as Tom uh, mentioned briefly before, uh, ever since uh, spring of last year, our instructional plan has been and continues to be responsive to public health conditions. Um, initially, that just meant we were almost entirely remote, uh, but as we start to come out of uh, those uh, circumstances and we see conditions continuing to improve, we're starting to see changes in what we can do. So given the positive trend for vaccination rates and decreasing infection rates and an expected easing of COVID-19 restrictions that apply to universities in the state of California, um, it is unlikely that we're going to have to revert to remote only instruction in fall quarter. But if conditions do not improve as expected, um, classes that are currently being scheduled for in-person may need to be shifted back to remote just as we did a year ago. Uh, heading into fall 2021. Again, we don't expect that that's going to happen, but we will, of course, pay very close attention to public health conditions, and we will abide by all the public health requirements that the university uh, is under, uh, and we'll make adjustments accordingly. So the second point, though, is that we would not do the opposite. So classes that are currently being scheduled for remote instruction in the fall will not be shifted back to in-person on short notice. And that's because uh, doing that would create some very difficult situations for students who've already registered and established living arrangements away from campus, anticipating those remote classes. That was our policy last year, that after we announced uh, remote instruction, we would not switch it back on short notice to in-person. And that remains our policy for fall quarter. Um, the last thing I'd like to say about this is just that we hope and expect that uh, we will be fully back to normal in winter 2022. But of course, we'll continue to watch uh, public health conditions and, and public health requirements very closely. So um, those are the four uh, FAQs that we wanted to address today. We have more FAQs up on our website, and we'll, we'll give you a link to that website later. But we want to shift into uh, the second part of the presentation right now and talk more about the ongoing work uh, of the Instructional Continuity Committee. And so to give you a, a quick idea of how we've organized ourselves, um, if we can see the, the next slide. Um, we, in our recent discussions, you know, it became clear that there were a lot of issues uh, for fall quarter that needed attention that we hadn't gotten to yet. And so we uh, divided our group up into six subcommittees to focus on uh, what we thought were the six uh, high priority issues. Um, and so what we're gonna do now is spend a little bit of time uh, hearing from uh, other members of the panel about some of these things. We'll talk about um, academic senate issues. We'll talk about student equity issues, the classroom technology initiative that I mentioned, uh, teaching and learning support, exam integrity, and on-campus space for remote learning. Um, our uh, divisional senate chair, uh, Jason Steich, is going to talk about academic senate issues. Uh, director for Excite, Richard Edwards, will talk about three of these topics classroom technology, teaching and learning support, and exam integrity. And I'll provide a couple of uh, brief updates on the others. So with that, I'd like to hand it off uh, to Jason for an update on Academic Senate discussions. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Tom, for telling us how we got to where we are and where, where we are headed um, this next year. Um, so I wanted just to recap what the Academic Senate focused on once we transitioned um, to remote. Um, we also considered the challenges that might be unforeseen to students um, in the process of taking a remote course or in, in their own lives uh, due to the pandemic. And so um, we changed some of the policies that, the, um, uh, that allow when students can drop a class and when they can change to a pass-fail grading system. And so normally that's a fifth week uh, deadline and we've changed that to the eighth week of the quarter. And that's been in place for um, this current academic year from fall, winter and spring uh, 2021 and also through the summer courses. And um, we have not yet um, formally voted on the policy, but I do expect that we will extend this um, eighth week um, drop ad deadline to the fall 
21 as well to recognize the transition that um, that you know this hybrid uh, uh, you know teaching and learning is going to be in the fall. Um, and I would like to say that to students who are who are listening to this to um, also think about responding to the survey and the, and the opportunity to to email us if if there are other um, aspects to this that would help we. We set up this flexibility with the in, with the idea that you would you would talk with the student advisor, your student advisor, about your options, so that um, you're making the best choice um, uh, for your your progression in your degree. So some of these th these deadlines are to give you more flexibility, but it's really important that you have a conversation with um, with an advisor. Uh, so that's that's what we've established within the Senate for flexibility. Um, and again, we are open to other input at this time, although hopefully um, you've you've been able to take advantage of this if, if it was necessary. And then the second part is um, more for the instructors is that we we recognize that there's been a lot of um, effort put into to teaching classes remotely. And a remote class is different than an online course. Um, and so um, while we may have experience in delivering content um, remotely through the computer screen that you're looking at now, um, we, we also recognize that, that faculty may want to turn their course into an online course, which, which has a more formal um, expectation of what the, how the content is delivered and how, how students will take that information in, take, take that uh, take that material. So the Senate is working with the Committee on Courses as well as input from um, the Graduate Council and the, um, the Committee on Educational Policy to develop, to, to, well, we have guidelines, but to make those guidelines clearer and to provide more um, information about how um, you could convert your course to an online course. And we will both have resources to um, uh, Richard Edwards' um, uh, um, resources in the Excite program, um, Center, as well as um, other examples of training that you can take to um, to develop your course as a, as an online course. So um, we want to make this clearer to faculty and to um, facilitate um, facilitate it, and also to make it clear the expectations of what an online course needs to have, so that it can be um, it, it can meet all of the educational standards and quality that we expect for our UCR courses. Um, so that, that's what's ongoing right now and we will continue to update with more information about the, any other policy, planned policy changes and sharing these guidelines um, as, as they are approved. I think that's all I have to say from the current Academic Senate um, focus within this subcommittee. So I guess I will turn it over uh, turn it back over to Ken to talk about student equity. Great, thanks Jason, appreciate those comments. Um, so a, a brief update on an important subcommittee that's really um, sort of just, just getting going, uh, the student equity issue subcommittee. So the, the charge for this subcommittee is to um, identify student equity issues, develop plans and identify resources that are needed to address the priority issues. Um, so some things that this group is starting to talk about, think about, um, and some things that they might do uh, in the near term. The, the first has to do with really, you know, understanding what these issues are. And so there's been some discussion about having focus groups uh, with students, um, and in particular focus groups that allow uh, different uh, cohorts of students to express their concerns and needs. So graduate students, first time freshmen, also second year students who haven't actually been to the UCR campus yet, and also our continuing students who have been at UCR already. Um, all of these groups, each of these groups probably has uh, different concerns, different levels of understanding about the campus. And so first understanding where each of them is at uh, would be an important step. Um, the second one has to do with communication. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons we're doing this webinar today is to uh, you know, continue to try to improve our communication with everyone about fall quarter instructional planning. Um, we wanna do the same thing for students in particular. And we wanna make sure that um, students can easily find the information that they're looking for that is specific to their uh, situation. Um, and we also wanna be proactive about making sure that we are getting that information out to them and, and making it easy for them to connect with that information. 
Uh, so thinking about the way that we communicate and, and our sort of our communication strategy is an important thing too. Um, the third one has to do with, you know, expectations in the fall with regard to instruction. Um, you know, we set up this committee because um, we want to be empathetic uh, towards uh, uh, student issues, student concerns. Um, but we want to actually operationalize that and implement that, that empathy uh, in ways that students can really see. Um, so we need to think about things like what kind of flexibility is going to be expected regarding uh, our instructional environment in the fall um, and really think specifically about what that means and also think specifically about you know, other aspects of, of campus operations and what kind of uh, empathy and flexibility we should be exhibiting in specific ways uh, towards students in the fall. Um, and the last thing uh, coming from our student affairs colleagues um, is that we really need to make sure that the support mechanisms that we're putting in place uh, for students in the fall are, uh, first of all, uh, uh, multiple and numerous in number, and also uh, clear and, and easily accessible uh, by students. So that uh, if they're having a challenging time uh, in a course, that uh, it's uh, not just the instructor who you think about approaching, but there are other avenues available to you as well to uh, deal with the uh, unique challenges that students might still be facing in fall quarter. So again, um, this group is, is really just starting to uh, wrap their head around these uh, challenging uh, topics, and there will be much more work and more to report on uh, over during the spring and summer as we get into this work. So with that, uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Richard Edwards, um, our director for our Center for Teaching and Learning, and I believe he's got three different topics he's going to talk about today. So Richard, go ahead. Thanks so much, Ken. I'm very happy to be able to share these updates. And as just a quick preamble for my comments, what's gonna be really key for everyone watching this campus briefing is help support us in getting the word out. We really wanna communicate that there are a lot of um, options that we're putting in place for the fall, but we really wanna have um, as many people as possible support us in spreading this word to your colleagues, to your departments. Um, and we are here to support and help all of the faculty and students be successful on our return to campus campaign for fall 2021. In terms of my first slide, I've been asked to speak a little bit about classroom technology. I know for the last year, all of us have been dealing with emergency remote teaching. And we've been teaching um, off of our laptops and at our homes and wherever it's been able to communicate and transfer our teaching and learning. But as we return to campus, we've really got, gotten a wonderful opportunity to upgrade all of our general assignment classrooms. These are the classrooms that are scheduled by the registrar office and there are most heavily utilized rooms. It's a portfolio of approximately 106 classrooms. All of the colleges at the university can apply for teaching in these rooms and they are been part of what Ken mentioned earlier. These have already been assigned for our return to in-person by the registrar and these class assignments will be in the banner system for students and faculty to know what rooms they are in in the fall. But what's really important is this is a large scale initiative, a partnership between the provost office, ITS and Excite. And what we have focused on is to make sure that these general assignment classrooms have new video and audio technologies to really give faculty members and students options. We're going to be hosting open houses about all of this and I'll get to that in a bit, but let me lay out a little bit of the vision between, behind what we call the RISE initiative. RISE stands for Rooms for Increasing Student Engagement. And we really wanted to give faculty members in particular a lot more options in our general assignment classrooms. These classrooms will have enhanced video, which will allow faculty members from the control panel in the classroom to push a button and record their lecture if they're teaching in person. You can do this if you just want to have a record of your in-person teaching. You can share it through our unlimited video storage solution, Uja, 
or you could do it in a live stream with students um, at a distance. This will all be up to the individual choice of a faculty member, but the technology will be in place. Second, these classes will have enhanced audio capabilities so that students will have the ability to be heard on microphone in these classrooms so that if you were creating a record of the instruction in the room, we are also bringing in the student voice and capturing it with new audio recording equipment. And this also enhances the ability to have a fuller, more complete record. If you're the type of instructor that asks a lot of questions or has a lot of back and forth with your students, these 106 rooms are designed to capture those interactions. Everything is going to be integrated with our two campus-wide video solutions. So these rooms will be integrated with Zoom and with Uja video. So you will be able to decide how you want to handle your recording. And it could just be a straight lecture capture, or it could be, as Ken has referred to, a dual mode option, where you would have the option, if you so chose, and you're in one of these classrooms, to open it up to students at a remote distance, because you would be able to integrate a distance Zoom session directly into your classroom. One thing I want to note, is a FAQ we're asked all the time about the RISE initiative is, are there more than 110 classrooms on campus? The answer is yes. We have about 350, give or take, instructional spaces. The ones we have focused on for the RISE initiative are the ones scheduled by the registrar office. There are approximately 250 other spaces that are run by schools or departments, and they are assigned by um, those schools and those chairs separately. And so what's important to recognize is that while one third of our classrooms by the end of the summer will have this enhanced technology, two thirds of our teaching spaces are not going to be upgraded at this point, but we are gonna be releasing guidance very soon for departments and for deans and schools to decide how they might want to adjust um, in the classrooms that are part of their teaching and learning space portfolios, how they can um, come into alignment with the RISE initiative. Finally, we know that all of these efforts, whether you're teaching in a RISE room in the fall or in one of your assigned departmental spaces, we are going to have robust teaching demonstrations and we are also going to be having enhanced uh, video training for faculty members who want to know more about the you know, types of pedagogies that can be supported in the fall. So just as Jason was saying about online, Excite here as UCR's Center for Teaching and Learning, we are here to partner with the faculty. So let you know myself know um, if there are any sort of particular trainings for your faculty or departments, because we'd be more than happy to customize trainings to meet very specific either disciplinary or departmental needs, but we are planning on a very robust training, especially on these newly upgraded classrooms so that faculty members will be able to step foot and get trained in these classrooms prior to the fall. So that's what I wanted to say about classroom technology. On the next slide, I'll be talking about teaching and learning support. What's important about this part of the initiative is we recognized that faculty members don't just have a technology issue in the fall. We know that there is going to be a lot of different support needs. We have all been working remotely for over 15 months and return to campus is going to require some additional support. So one of the things that has been approved um, is we are creating a new one-time program that's only gonna be in existence for fall 2021, and it's called the Instructional Continuity Consultants. This is going to be a brand new cohort of 50 graduate students that uh, the uh, position announcement has already gone out and we've already got a robust um, interest in this, but Excite is going to be able to hire 50 new graduate students. These are not replacing any of the graduate students that have already been 
delegated or assigned by the department. This is an extra added 50 graduate students that are gonna have one job in the fall to assist on instructional continuity so that as faculty members return from a year and a half of being remote, we can have more people working with the faculty, this cohort of 50, to help deal with the myriad of adjustment issues and um, return to campus issues that we are going to need to address. Of particular focus, any faculty members who are interested in exploring dual mode instruction, as Ken said, it's an option that's available. We wanted to be able to give those faculty members who opt into dual mode this additional graduate student support so that we're not just asking you to go dual mode with no additional help. We feel that if you wanna opt into this program, we can help you by providing additional technical and pedagogical support to make sure you as the faculty member are successful. So we are working right now on a plan that we have more or less 40 departments in our undergraduate education portfolio at UC Riverside. And we will be assigning one of these instructional consultants to each department as your point of contact. So by the, hopefully within a few months after we get through the hiring process, we'll be able to announce who, which graduate students assigned to each department. And then that'll be your point of entry to ask for this enhanced support. So I just wanna close remarks on instructional continuity consultants this way. We didn't just upgrade the classrooms with brand new technology that's going to help um, achieve different types of pedagogical modes. We also got approval to hire additional graduate students to support that initiative. So it's both technology and pedagogy together, all focused on making sure the faculty have a pathway to success. We're also during this time working on an updated Keep Teaching website. The Keep Teaching website has been a highly used resource by faculty, and we are planning on supporting it long-term at the university. We just spent three months re-envisioning and redesigning Keep Teaching. Currently, the website does receive 10,000 visits a month. So we know it's a very heavily used and valued resource. And we are creating a brand new visual dashboard. And we have also streamlined all of the instructions and we're now starting to emphasize short form video tutorials at the request of the faculty. So we're about ready to relaunch the site. It's of course still running today, but it's gonna get a nice uh, reboot during the month of May. So be looking and checking your email um, down the road for when we uh, officially relaunch the brand new updated Keep Teaching website. Um, finally, in addition to the video communication I've already talked about, um, myself and my um, co-director, Israel Fledes, who is the director of Academic Technologies Insight in Excite, both myself and Israel, we are available for 10 minute campus, I mean, departmental visits. So if you are a department chair, please consider inviting Israel and myself to a future department meeting before the fall, because we have a 10 minute pre presentation we make to help your faculty not only understand all of these changes, but we like to answer the questions directly from the faculty. We like to come straight into the department meeting and say, do you have any questions for us? Nothing's out of bounds because we are here to help and support the faculty. And then on my final slide, I've been asked to speak a little bit about exam integrity. And so in terms of, oh, I'm sorry, the next slide is teaching and learning support. Um, Jason alluded to this in terms of his remarks that Excite is collaborating with the Faculty Senate and many of its subcommittees in order to meet the new demand. So one of the things I wanna be very upfront about is the interest in higher quality online learning is being driven by the faculty. Excite and the Faculty Senate are both getting requests from faculty members who are saying, how do I go and do this better? How can I improve my teaching if I want to um, continue to teach online after the emergency remote uh, period of the pandemic response is done, how do we go about it? 
We are in the process right now of partnering with the Faculty Senate and with any, again, departments that are wanting to be a part of this conversation to really talk about what online looking, uh, online teaching and learning looks like after the emergency remote experience we have all just shared. So this is in process and I don't have a ton to report on it yet because all these things are happening in real time and we're looking for conversations, partnerships and discussions so that we can all work collaboratively together to build a new vision for online teaching at UCR. Two things though that I can mention. The first one is we did launch um, with the support of the provost office in uh, the winter quarter, a competition for what we called the remote course conversion grant. We had a lot of faculty members who had spent a lot of time developing remote courses who asked what would take these courses to the next level? How would they be nationally recognized as high quality online courses? And so we put out a program, got a lot of responses and we announced 19 winners who are currently in the process of doing multiple developments regarding the remote course. They're undergoing a 10 week national certification with a recognized vendor in teaching certification for online teaching to up their pedagogical skill with dealing with uh, the online modality. But they're also working with Excite's team of instructional designers. Excite, as UCR's Center for Teaching and Learning, we have four full-time staff members who work with faculty members with a background in innovative course design and pedagogical learning theories. We're open for business. We're always interested in working with faculty members who want to collaborate and partner with us because we are here to serve the needs of teaching and learning for the university. And so during these remote course conversion grant winners, they all pair off with one of Excite's instructional designers to then create a new module map for their course and build a course based on evidence-based best practices for what works for teaching and learning in online environments. The final thing I wanna mention is we just found out um, last week that Excite is gonna be able to offer a new program in the 2021-2022 school year. We are going to be able to offer communities of practice to the UCR faculty. These communities of practice are going to be um, competitive and we're gonna be putting out an announcement soon, but we're gonna want faculty led groups that are going to work in groups of 10 to help create year long strategies for online course conversions. And so in addition to these remote course conversion grants, we want to incentivize faculty communities to come together to do similar work. And in the communities of practice, there will be a multi-quarter uh, cohort designed for faculty members to work collaboratively together, faculty-led, Excite supported, but ultimately with the goal of faculty members developing their own policies. And this is again, something we'll work with the Faculty Senate on very closely to continue to drive forward all of the experiences. I mean, this is the way to come out of the pandemic and say, we have learned a lot of things of things we liked about what we were doing with our online teaching and things that we would want to adjust. These community of practices would allow the faculty voice and try to create a space on campus for faculty members to collaborate in a structured manner to drive this, um, the future of online teaching and learning at the university forward. So thank you. Richard, I think the, you have one more, right? On exam integrity. Oh, sorry. No problem, thanks. I apologize. Thank you, Ken. So exam integrity. So today, if you sign on to Keep Teaching, which is keepteaching.ucr.edu, our lead story today are, is brand new guidance on the campus on how to create a more secure exam environment for online testing. What is wonderful about this is it was developed out of the experiences of faculty. Excite has been following what some of the most successful faculty members have been doing in order to create more secure exams. And today we've been able to publish the results of over a year of work 
of what we are determining tends to be the most successful uses of our new technologies. For those of you who aren't aware, we're in the process of converting to a new learning management system, Canvas. And within Canvas, there's a lot of different default settings for exam design that creates a more secure exam. We also have two new products that were just purchased for this school year and will be supported long-term by the university. We have UJA Proctoring, which is our, um, un which is available to all faculty members for video-based online proctoring. And we have lots of robust support materials at, ex at Keep Teaching about that, but you can also make an appointment with Excite if you wanna learn more about UJA Proctoring. And then we also have Respond to This Lockdown Browser, which creates a more secure, exam experience by shutting down the ability of students to um, go elsewhere um, while they're in a test environment. They, they, it locks down all of their browsers so that only the test is available to them. Um, we are aware there have been issues with academic integrity in our rapid shift to emergency remote um, courses, but I do want to um, talk about you know, what we're looking at for the fall. So in the fall, there are gonna be no in-person exams for remote courses. All of the remote courses are gonna to continue to have to do um, secure online exams. And we just published best practices today at Keep Teaching. But second, if you are returning back to in-person and want to do exams, we are still working with the Faculty Senate and with other um, departments to just still figure out in the transitional period what are gonna be some of our best practices for all of this. But if there are any questions, since again, just like with the pandemic itself, this is an evolving situation, please feel free to reach out to Excite and we are definitely willing to consult on a one-to-one -one basis with any faculty member or any department so that we do this you know, transparently and that we have a uh, you know, ability to solve the problems in different disciplines that might be arising because one size does not fit all in this universe. We wanna have unique solutions that work for the faculty members and we're not just pushing a single solution. Great, thank you, Richard. And, um, you know, thanks more generally to all the work in undergraduate education uh, during the pandemic and heading into fall, um, really appreciate it. So uh, just a few more slides here, and it looks like we'll end just about on time. Uh, one last subcommittee that we want to mention is focusing on on-campus space for remote learning. Um, and the, the concern here is that we'll have students who are living on campus or near campus. They'll be coming to class to take in-person classes, um, and they'll also have uh, a, a remote course. Um, they might have an in-person course and a remote course back-to-back. And it might be difficult to go from that in-person class on campus uh, back to their dorm or their apartment where they might uh, like to be uh, logging in for their remote course. So we've been looking for places around campus so that students can more easily um, uh, get to that next remote class on time um, and have a, an, an appropriate place uh, to participate in the class. And so we've sort of been um, uh, doing three things here. First is looking for some appropriate indoor spaces and we're exploring uh, the hub, the new Student Success Center, which is almost completed, and space in Rivera and Borbach libraries. We're also looking for appropriate outdoor space. Um, we've been looking, examining our, our outdoor Wi-Fi coverage and thinking about areas that we could strategically um, upgrade that coverage and provide some additional outdoor seating so that students could also attend their uh, remote classes uh, from, from outdoors on campus. And then finally, we're also thinking about um, what additional uh, technology tools and resources students might need uh, for their remote learning in the fall. And so, of course, we're looking to the successful uh, Loan to Learn program that ITS established uh, last year to get uh, technology uh, into the hands of students who need it. And also looking to add more charging stations, especially uh, at these areas that we identify where students would go to participate in their remote courses while they're on campus. So that's, uh, again, a group that starts just sort of starting their work, and there will be more updates uh, over the summer, um, and we'll be sure to share those with you before fall. Okay, um, wanted to end with uh, some information for you about where you can look for, uh, for more information, and if you have questions, 
Of course, the campusreturn.ucr.edu website is really the main hub for information uh, as we come back to campus, uh, teaching and learning on campus in the fall. Uh, you can also find weekly updates uh, in inside UCR, so be sure to check that. And finally, if you have a question that's not answered on the website or with one of our updates, you can contact Julia McLean in the provost office and her address is, her email address is there on the slide. So uh, thanks to the panelists who joined us today and thanks to everyone who joined the webinar or who will uh, view the webinar after it's been posted. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone back on campus in the fall.